Hotel World. This your brother Matthew Daniels, aka Ampu, aka The Chosen Few, aka The Real Bookworm. I'm not a bookworm world, I'm the real bookworm. Make sure you get it right. And as always, may your name live on forever and may your memory never die. Hotel, cheers to that. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Josephus, the traitor, in his own words. Now, Josephus is a first century Jewish historian who wrote several monumental works. Um, maybe the most popular of these is Antiquities of the Jews, but he also wrote The Wars of the Jews. He wrote uh, autobiographical text, The Life of Flavius Josephus. And he also wrote a text that I have called Against the Pion. Now, Josephus is purported to be a traitor of his people. Now, we're not going to get into the whole debate on whether he, he was a traitor or whether he was not a traitor, because this is something that I debate back and forth with some of my Jewish um, Hebrew friends um, all the time. So I don't want to actually get into that specific debate on whether or not he was a traitor. We're just going to deal with the claim that he was a traitor. Now, why they say he was a traitor, I'm going to give you a little background. Now, Josephus was actually a participant in the war between Rome and um, Judea, the Jewish-Roman War, okay, that eventually ended when Vespasian and his son Titus conquered Judea, destroyed the temple in around 70, 73 AD, CE. Um, Josephus fought in that war, okay, and Josephus was a general in that war, and so there came a time when um, Josephus allowed himself to be captured by Vespasian and he, uh, basically lived out the rest of his days in Rome, in the house of Vespasian and after Vespasian, his son Titus, and he lived quite comfortably. So he's known as a traitor because he started out fighting in the fight, um, with the Rome, Romans against the Jews and he ended it, um, living with the conquerors of the of the Judeans. So what I want to do, I want to go to the actual text and I want to read, Josephus actually documents this. Now we know about his traitorous ways, quote, quote unquote, from Josephus himself. So what I want to do is I want to go to his written records so we can see him explain for himself why he defected, why he allowed himself to be captured by Vespasian because this is the crux of the matter. Okay, he is called a traitor for this act. Let us see what he says in his own words, why he did this. Okay, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at this book I have. It's called The Complete Works of Flavius Josephus, and um, it includes all of those works that I just named. We're going to be looking into his work known as The Wars of the Jews. And this is going to be in book three, if anybody want to um, hunt it down. And then the version that I have is Wars of the Jews by Josephus, book three, chapter eight. Okay, and we're going to start... And I'm, I gave you a little background because I'm just going to start right in the middle because it, this is a massive, massive work and I don't want to read it all. Okay. He says, when he had said this, he complied with Nicanor's invitation. But when those Jews who had fled with him understood that he yielded to those that invited him to come up, they came about him in a body and cried out. Now, what they're talking about is... When Vespasian came to um, conquer um, um, the rebels and the revolt in Judea, the Jews fought back. But they were um, they, they fought hard, but ultimately they were no match for the um, for the Roman armies. Okay, and so um, the area where Josephus and his men were fighting in, a lot of them got slaughtered. So Josephus, his men, and some other Jews, they found a spot in the city to hide out. OK, now at one point they sent a female that was hiding out with them out into the city to try to um, to try to, you know, find a way to where they could flee the city and, and exit the city. They, they wanted to find a passageway that wasn't um, being monitored by the Roman soldiers so they could escape. Now, this woman, she was captured by the Romans 
and she told the Romans, okay, look, this is where I, I was hiding out at. This is who I was hiding out with. This is where they're at. Okay. And so when they found out that she had been hiding out with um, Josephus, who was a, a general who had been fighting against them, they told Vespasian that, hey, we found out where some of these Jews are hiding. We know where Josephus is at. And so Vespasian sent this guy to negotiate their surrender. And he basically said, hey, look, go tell Josephus and the rest of them. If they come out of this hole, if they come out of hiding, we're going to spare their lives and basically take them into captivity. If they don't come out, we're just going to go in and we're going to kill them all. So what Josephus is saying is when the candor came on behalf of Vespasian and told him to go ahead and surrender, he was prepared to surrender. When the people that were with him heard that he was going to surrender, they got upset with him. So that's where we're at in the story. He says, um, and they, they cried out to Josephus, nay, indeed, now may the laws of our forefathers, which God ordained himself, well grown to purpose that God, we mean who hath created the souls of the Jews of such a temper that they despise death. O Josephus, art thou still fond of life? And canst thou bear to see the light in a state of slavery? How soon hast thou forgotten thyself? How many hast thou persuaded to lose their lives for liberty? Thou hast therefore had a false reputation for manhood and a like false reputation for wisdom. If thou canst not hope for preservation from those against whom thou hast fought so zealously and art however willing to be preserved by them, if they be in earnest. But although the good fortune of the Romans had made thee forget thyself, we ought to take care that the glory of our forefathers may not be tarnished. We will lend thee our right hand and a sword. And if thou wilt die willingly, thou wilt die as general of the Jews. But if unwillingly, thou wilt die as a traitor to them. As soon as they said this, they began to thrust their swords at him and threatened they would kill him if he thought of yielding himself to the Romans. So basically what Josephus is saying is he was prepared to surrender. When the people that were hiding out with him found this out, they, you know, they all ran up to him. And I was like, oh, whoa, 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 hold on, Josephus. Have you already forgotten yourself? Or was this whole show of being a general and being a man and having manhood, was it all a show? Are you really a coward? Have you already forgot how many of our fathers and children sons, brothers, uncles, that you convinced to die, right? Because Josephus was a general and he, he spoke well and he convinced many of the Jews to fight against the Romans and they lost their lives. So what his people were telling him is, bro, you already convinced our fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers, uncles, cousins to fight and die. And now when it looks like it's your turn to die, you're ready to surrender and submit to slavery. Have you really been a coward this whole time or have you forgotten yourself in the fear of the moment? What, what we'll do for you, if you haven't forgotten yourself, if you're really a general, if you're really a man, if you're really a Jew and you don't want to violate God in this manner, let just allow us. We'll kill you right now and you can die as the general of the Jews. But if you surrender and submit yourself to, uh, to Vespasian, then you're going to go down as a traitor to the Jews. So we see right here is where this traitor concept <laughs> originally came from. His own people told him, bro, if you surrender, you'll forever be known as a traitor. If you don't want to be known as a traitor, you need to just give up, lay down your life right here, right now. Go out like a, a soldier. Go out like a G. You understand what I'm saying? And so this is what this is what they told Josephus. Bro, no, no, man, no. We, all of us, we didn't already die. The Romans, they probably finna kill us too. It ain't no giving up now. It's, we fighting to the death. If we don't win, we just gonna die like men. This is what they tell you. So Josephus writes, upon this, Josephus, and he's writing about himself in the third person, but Josephus is writing this. Upon this, Josephus was afraid of their attacking him and yet thought he should be a betrayer of the commands of God if he died before they were delivered. So he began to talk like a philosopher to them in the distress he was then in when he said thus to them. So 
jo Josephus sees that he's about to kill him. Now, at this point, Josephus doesn't want to die, so he's going to try to talk his way out of it. And let's see what he says. Uh, oh, my friends, why are we... Sorry, these cats, man. Oh, my friends, why are we so earnest to kill ourselves? And why do we set our soul and body, which are such dear companions, as such variants? Can anyone pretend that I am not the man I was formerly? Nay, the Romans are sensible how that matter stands well enough. It is a brave thing to die in war, but so that it be according to the law of war by the hand of conquerors. If therefore I avoid death from the sword of the Romans, I am truly worthy to be killed by my own sword and my own hand. But if they admit of mercy and would spare their enemy, how much more ought we to have mercy upon ourselves and to spare ourselves? For it is certainly a foolish thing to do that to ourselves, which we quarrel with them for doing to us. So he's basically going into a, into his diatribe and he's saying, look, man, yeah, it's an honorable thing to die in war. But if you don't have to, why die? And why should we kill ourselves? Because the conversation turned into it'll be better for us to kill ourselves than allow ourselves to be captured by the Romans. And so he was like, look, why are we complaining about being killed by the Romans? But we're willing to kill ourselves. That's that's backwards. That's crazy. That's stupid. If we don't want the Romans to kill us. Why would we do the job for the Romans themselves and kill us? So he's trying to philosophize himself out of this situation. He goes on to say, I confess freely that it is a brave thing to die for liberty, but still so that it be in war and done by those who take that liberty from us. But at present, our enemies do neither meet us in battle, nor do they kill us. Now, he is equally a coward who will not die when he is obliged to die, and he who will die when he is, a not, when he is not obliged so to do. What are we afraid of when we will not go up to the Romans? Is it debt? If so, what are we afraid of when we but suspect our enemies will inflict it on us, Shall we inflict it on ourselves for certain? But it may be said, we must be slaves. And are we then in a clear state of liberty at present? It may also be said that it is a manly act for one to kill himself. No, certainly, but a most unmanly one. As I should esteem that Pilate to be an errant coward who out of fear of a storm, should sink his ship of his own accord. So he's basically saying, look, why do y'all want to kill yourselves in this hole hiding away? Are you afraid that if we come out of this hole and submit ourselves to the Romans that they're going to kill us? Well, if we're afraid of death by the hands of the Romans, what sense does it make to kill ourselves? And one may argue that it is a manly thing to die in war, but that's in the heat of battle when death is imminent. In the state that we're in right now, and this is his philosophy, in the state that we're in right now, death is not imminent. And it would be more um, um, manly of us to go come out of this hole alive and face our enemies. Then if they decide to kill us, they kill us and we still die in a, in a manly manner. But it's ultimate cowardice to kill ourselves. And he used the analogy. He says, what captain of a ship? would in expectation of a storm coming. He hears that a storm is coming, so he sinks his own ship. So he likens a captain sinking his own ship because a storm is on the way to these guys wanting to kill themselves because they fear that the Romans are going to kill them. So he's trying to, you know, talk his way out of it because he wants to surrender. These guys would rather kill themselves. So he's trying to convince them otherwise because he doesn't agree with that train of thought. So he goes on to say, now, self-murder is a crime most remote from the common nature of all animals and an instance of impiety against God, our creator. Nor indeed is there any animal that dies by its own contrivance or by its own means. For the desire of life is a law engraven in them all, on which account we deem those that openly take it away from us to be our enemies 
and those that do it by treachery are punished for so doing. And do you not think that God is very angry when a man does injury to what he hath bestowed on him? For from him it is that we have received our being, and we are to leave it in his disposal to take that being away from us. The bodies of men are indeed mortal and are created out of corruptible matter, but the soul is ever immortal and is a portion of the divinity that inhabits our bodies. Besides, if anyone destroys or abuses a deposit, a depositum he hath received from a mere man, he is esteemed a wicked and perfidious person. But then, if anyone cast out of his body this divine depositum, can we imagine that he is there affronted, doth not know of it? So he's basically now he's saying that in suicide in essence it's against God. Because murder is against God. To take the life of something is against God. And in fact, it goes against nature because no animal in nature naturally just kills itself. So he's basically saying that they just kill themselves, then they're actually going against the creator, right? They're actually going against their holy creator. So now he's bringing a theological perspective into his philosophical perspective to further try to explain to him why he would rather give himself up to the Romans and submit himself to being captured. Because he's saying if he's meant to die, he would rather just the Romans kill him after he surrendered, then he's not going to kill himself. He's not prepared to kill himself, right? So he says, moreover, our law justly ordains that slaves who run away from their masters shall be punished, though the masters they ran away from may have been wicked masters to them. And shall we endeavor to run away from God, who is the best of all masters, and not think ourselves highly guilty of impiety? Do not you know that those who depart out of this life according to the law of nature and pay that debt which was received from God when he that lent it us is pleased to require it back enjoy eternal fame, that their houses and their posterity are sure? that their souls are pure and obedient and obtain a most holy place in heaven from whence in the revolution of ages, they are again sent in pure bodies while the souls of those whose hands have acted madly against themselves are received by the darkest place in Hades. And while God who is their father punishes those that offend against either of them and their posterity, for which reason God hates such doings and the crime is punished by our most wise legislator. Accordingly, our laws determine that the bodies of such as kill themselves should be exposed to the sun be set without burial, although at the same time it be allowed them to be lawful to bury our enemy sooner. So now he's going into the law of the Jews. He's saying that apparently there was some type of law amongst the Jews that an individual who killed himself, it was seen as a, as a bad thing. It was, it, was, it was basically against the law. And their body was meant to be left out into the sun and not even receive a proper burial for a set amount of time because they had desecrated themselves by taking their own lives. So this is a further theological perspective that he's bringing into this whole concept of them killing themselves, right? Now he's talking about it's actually against the law, our laws. Y'all are talking about me violating God by submitting myself to be captured, but you guys are talking about killing yourselves. Killing yourselves is in direct violation to the law. So he went philosophical on them, theologically on them, and now he's going directly into the laws that they follow themselves. He goes on to say, the laws of other nations also enjoin such men's hands to be cut off when they are dead, which have been made use of in destroying themselves when alive. While they reckon that as the body is alien from the soul, so is the hand alien from the body. It is therefore, my friends, a right thing to reason justly and not add to the calamities which men bring upon us piety towards our creator. If we have a mind to preserve ourselves, let us do it. For to be preserved by those our enemies to whom we have given so many demonstrations of our courage is no way inglorious. But if we have a mind to die, it is good to die by the hand of those that have conquered us. 
For my part, I will not run over to our enemy's quarters in order to be a traitor to myself. For certainly, I should then be much more foolish than those that deserted to the enemy since they did it in order to save themselves, and I should do it for my own destruction. However, I heartily wish the Romans may prove treacherous in this matter, for if, after their offer of their right hand for security, I be slain by them, I shall die cheerfully and carry away with me the sense of their perfidiousness as a consolation greater than victory itself. So I'm going to stop reading there and I'm going to just basically tell you guys what happened. So that was what Josephus said in his own words about why he um, surrendered to the Romans. OK, that was his explanation. Now, you can take that explanation, interpret it how you will and come to your own conclusion about how you feel about it. So what happened was the people that were with him, they weren't convinced. They still didn't want him to surrender. They didn't want to surrender themselves. They wanted to die. But he did convince them that to just commit suicide, to kill themselves would be wrong. So according to Josephus, he goes on further in that, in that same work, in that same chapter. What he says happens is they cast lots, okay? And so it's a group of men. They cast lots about who would go first. And I guess they basically sat like in a circle. And so what happened was the whoever the lot fell on, that individual, right, would have to kill the person um, next to them, right? After, when they kill the person next to them, the person next to them will kill them, okay? Then the person that killed them, the next person will kill them. And then the next person will kill them, the next person will kill them, the next person will kill them, the next person will kill them. And it would go like that until you had one person left or you have two people left, one kills the other. And then the last man standing is supposed to um, kill himself. That way, it would only be one individual that committed suicide Everybody else died by the hand of their brother, but they all died honorably and they didn't submit. So um, Josephus, he didn't want to do that either, but they wouldn't let him surrender. They came to kill him when he tried to leave. So he was like, OK, 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 I'll do it. Right. He said he'll do it. And so out of luck or divine providence, who knows? Um, they play this game. Everybody dies. But Josephus and one other individual. Apparently, when it got down to Josephus and his one other individual, they decided that, hey, they didn't they didn't want to die. I don't know who was supposed to kill who. I don't know if Josephus was supposed to kill him or if he was supposed to kill Josephus. But Josephus says it came down to two people. They didn't kill each other and they didn't kill themselves. They gave themselves up. OK, so when they give themselves up, Josephus. He makes a prophecy. At this point, Vespasian, who eventually became an emperor of Rome, he was not yet the emperor. He was just a general in the Roman army. When he came up and he was arrested and he was captured, he was supposed to be taken back to Rome so he could be made a public spectacle of, right? They, they captured somebody who was a general, somebody who was known, somebody who was famous. What the Romans would like to do, these, these high-value prisoners, they would like to bring them back to Rome, parade them through the streets, and then kill them. Right. So what Josephus does is he tells the people not to take him back to Rome. It was like, uh, why would you take me back to Rome to Nero? Nero was um, um, the emperor at the time. He was like, why would you take me back to, um, to Rome to Nero? Nero is not going to be the emperor too much longer. And he makes a prophecy and he prophesies that Vespasian is going to be um, emperor soon and he is going to run the empire. And so what eventually happens is a little time goes by and while um, Vespasian is still out in the field, he gets word that Nero is dead and that um, the people of Rome are calling him back to Rome to make him emperor. And so when he hears that, um, obviously he remembers what Josephus says and he was like, oh my goodness, this guy must be some kind of a prophet, right? This guy knew the future. He said that I was going to be the emperor. And now they're calling me back to be the emperor. So Vespasian brought Josephus in close to himself and he kept him close to him for the rest of his life. And it was because Josephus got close to Vespasian and he was close to his son Titus that he was in a position to actually write the antiquities of the Jews, the wars of the Jews um, against the Pion and his autobiographical um, 
work. Now, there is so much more that I can actually say about Josephus and the life of Josephus and the works of Josephus, but what I really wanted to highlight in this video is what I read. I wanted you guys to get an understanding of Josephus in his own words, why he decided to surrender. Now, there are going to be those who still are going to feel like, you know, he was a dirty, cowardly traitor. Eh, that's whatever. But at least now he 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 was able to speak for himself. Right? He was able to speak for himself and explain why he he decided to defect and not to just kill himself while he was um in that in that hole. So I hope you guys like that. I hope you guys um as always. I hope you guys heard something that you never heard before. If you if you did hear something that you have heard before, I hope I gave more clarity and insight into it. Um, before I go. I got some real good news. Um, I just completed my third novel, right? I'm just completing my third novel. I'm building my catalog. This book is called Big Game Hunting, right? Big Game Hunting. And this is a nonfiction work. It's all fact, no fiction. And what I do is I document um, police corruption in my hometown of um, Texas City, Texas. And I give you guys... 10 years worth of research that I that I personally did where I uncovered decades old conspiracies, right? And I, I document um, police officers committing all types of crimes. And I document the cover-ups. And I, I prove it. I prove it with newspaper articles, emails, eyewitness testimony, court records, arrest records, um, lawsuits. Uh, lawyer records. I mean, it's information overload. If you buy this book, you're not only going to hear my story about the conspiracy and about the corruption and me telling various stories about cops committing crimes, but I'm also going to prove that the cops committed the crime. I'm talking about murder, rape, sexual assault, sexual harassment, illegal arms deals, um, prostitution, um, um, scamming the government out of out of um out of emergency funds that were that were meant for the people um I'm talking about um public intoxication driving with a suspended license um you know just all different types of crime almost any crime imaginable right making false charges on people violating constitutional rights assaulting the public cops assaulting other cops i mean I just throw it all into this book and I give you all of the documentation to prove it. So what I want you guys to do, I uh, thank you guys for supporting me so far. I want you guys to go to Amazon.com. I want you to type in Big Game Hunting by Matthew Daniels and I want you to order that book. You can get the e ebook e version for $1.99 or you can get the paperback version for $10. And um, I haven't got my personal copies in yet or I will show you guys what it looked like. but. I do have these. What I want you guys to do also, get, if you haven't already, purchase my novel, Suicide Note. When you're in, when, uh, while you're on Amazon and you're purchasing Big Game Hunting, also purchase Suicide Note by Matthew Daniels, okay? You can get the ebook version of this for 99 cents and you can get the paperback, okay? You can get the paperback for $15, okay? I also have my um, novel. You can get this on Amazon as well, Thicker Than Water. Thicker Than Water by Matthew Daniels. Um, the ebook version of this is 99 cents as well. And you can get the uh, paperback version for $17. So I got Thicker Than Water um, for $17 paperback, 99 cents ebook version. I have Suicide Note by Matthew Daniels, uh, $15 paperback, 99 cents ebook version. And I now have my third book, nonfiction, all fact, no fiction about police corruption in Texas City, Texas, um, Big Game Hunting, 99 cents for, no, I'm sorry, $1.99 for the ebook version and $10 for the paperback version. So show your support for that. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Um, like, share, subscribe, all of that good stuff. Leave me a comment and let me know what you think. This your brother, Matthew Daniels, AKA Ampoo, AKA The Chosen Few, AKA The Real Bookworm. I'm not a bookworm, world. I'm the real bookworm. Make sure you get it right. And as always, world, may your name live on forever. And may your memory never die. Hotel, cheers to that. Peace, I'm out.